Well, good morning, man. I am so excited to be here uh, with you this morning. Good morning to our online family. Good morning to the mask service. Normally, I'm over in the mask service during uh, this time, but they wouldn't let me preach from there and video it in here. So I'm sorry. I love you guys, and uh, I didn't abandon you, okay? Hey, I'm so excited to be here uh, with you this morning. Uh, Carissa and I, my wife Carissa, we are so ecstatic uh, to be a part of this staff, to be a part of this amazing team of pastors. I uh, am from this church. If you weren't here when they introduced us, I, I'm from here. I, I started coming here when I was in high school. Uh, my grandfather was a pastor down at Valley Junction for 30 years, at Valley Junction Church of God. And uh, I, I, when he retired, I came over here and started coming here. Pastor Brian was my youth pastor. Uh, pastor Weaver yelled at me every time he saw me in the lobby. I don't know why. I still have scars from memories from that. Um, but I love being here. I, I don't know why you yelled at me either. Don't just shrug at me. Uh, <laughs> you just did. I'm just playing. He's not as loud as my mom. It's okay. Uh, I love being here. Carissa, my wife, she's from, uh, she grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And so she's one of those, uh, first of all, she's a cheese head, pray for her. Um, but she's also one of those weird people that pray for more snow, you know, about this time of the year. February is not over. Give me more snow. And I'm like, please stop. Uh, so if you guys could pray for us. But we are so excited and honored to get to be a part of this church family, to get to, get to be a part of the youth team. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I, I feel and I know and I believe in my heart uh, that this church family is uniquely and abundantly blessed and one of the most blessed church families in America because of the pastors that are on staff at this church. Do you love your pastors? Can we just show appreciation? Pastor Weaver, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Brett, Pastor Brian, Pastor Gary, Pastor Kerry. I'm going to name them all. Pastor Zach, Pastor Luke, Pastor Austin. And I'll leave my name out of there. Pastor Courtney, Pastor Anna. Love them all. They're fantastic. But this morning, we are continuing our series through Romans uh, as a church family. And if you haven't been already, you are in a very unique position. You know exactly where we're going within this sermon series. You know exactly what we're going to be talking about on Sundays. Why? Because... We're going through the book of Romans, and that has been available to you for 2,000 years in this book, okay? <laughs> like, you can read that, and I would challenge you to read the chapter before we get to church. Maybe take time and, you know, take it a step further. Read the chapter every single day of the week before you get to church, because how much better would Sundays be if God has already been talking to you about the subject matter throughout the week? You know next Sunday we're going to be talking about Romans 12. So read Romans 12 this week. Allow God to speak to you. Ask God to tell you uh, something new from Romans 12 because when we get to church, how awesome would it be if as we talked about it as a family, it was just an extra dose of the Holy Spirit. It was just another piece built on the foundation that God has already been laying all week. Read your Bibles, friends. Love you. It's important to read your Bible. It's important to be in God's word throughout the week. Why? Because we believe that our God is alive and active. We believe that our God still has something to say to us right here and right now in this day and age. We believe that our God is the only God who can do a divine work in this world and in this nation today. But we also know and have to recognize the truth that God works through his people who are full of the Holy Spirit. And how can his people work if they don't know his voice? How can his people spread the truth in love like Pastor Weaver talked about if you don't know his word, if you don't know his truth? We need to read the Bible. That's my soapbox rant. But God works through his people who are willing to speak his truth at the very same time that they are showing his love by being the hands and feet of Jesus to a lost, a dark, a broken and dying world. And if we, the good church people, I mean, you're not as good as the 830 because they got up, or excuse me, eight o'clock because they got up early. It's 930, but you're still good church people and I love you, okay? 
But if we, the good church people, if we aren't willing to be the hands and feet of Jesus, if we aren't willing to carry the light of Jesus into dark worlds, if we aren't willing to unleash the power of the Holy Spirit and see miracles happen in the world, if we aren't people who are willing to show the love of Jesus to people in this world, who will be? Who's it gonna be? Who's gonna do it? Because if we don't do it, friends, nobody will. If we the people who claim to know Jesus, if we the people who claim to follow Jesus, if we the people who have access to the Bible and we're supposed to be the ones reading it, if we're not reading it and speaking the words out in this world, who's gonna do it? The answer is nobody. It's up to us. If you wanna see the revival that you've been praying for come to fruition in this nation, friends, it's time to start doing something about it. And last week, Pastor Jeff challenged us in an inspiring message about being people who bring the good news of the gospel to this world. He challenged us to be people who have beautiful feet. He read the verse, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of Jesus Christ to this world. That's our challenge. And if you missed last week, friends, find it on the YouTube. Some people got that. Some of you are like, what's the YouTube? It's a great question. Pastor Zach is in the back. He's more than happy to help you figure that out this morning. But today we're in Romans chapter 11. And honestly, this is one of those chapters in the Bible that traditionally we as good church people gloss over. This isn't one of the chapters in the Bible that we ruminate on and say, wow, man, this thing is so chock full of wisdom for today, and I love this. This isn't one of the chapters of, of the Bible that you're going to see verses being pulled from it and being printed on t-shirts and being sold at the Christian bookstores and things like that. This isn't one of the chapters of the Bible where you're gonna find a verse from that and you're gonna to wanna to paint it on a wall in your house. This isn't one of those verses. This chapter of Romans is one of those chapters that you read and when you get to the end of it, you're sitting there like, what did I just read? What just happened? And so then you read it again and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna read it one more time. And then you read it again and you're like, I'm more lost now than I was the first time I read it. I shouldn't have done that. This is one of those chapters. Even Paul, at the end of this very chapter, says these words in Romans eleven thirty three. 33. He says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. Modern day interpretation of said verse. God's awesome, but sometimes he's impossible to understand. Sometimes he says things that we just do not and will not understand. But the truth is this, God is still talking. God still has something to say. And even though the chapter might be hard to read, even though it might be slightly boring to read, even though it might be hard to understand, God is still trying to speak to his people in those moments. God has something to say this morning in Romans chapter 11. And so let's dive into it. Paul, he's talking to the church in Rome. It's a very diverse crowd. Full, it's a church full of ethnic Jews, biological descendants of Abraham, who became believers in Jesus. And then uh, it's, it's got foreign converts to Judaism. So they were foreigners who converted to Judaism, and then they converted to Christianity. They started following Jesus there in this church. And then uh, they have these people called the Gentiles, and you're like, what's a Gentile? You're a Gentile, okay? Gentiles are any people, a person who is not a uh, biological descendant of Abraham. So if you skip that day in Sunday school, friend, you're a Gentile, congratulations. If your family line doesn't trace back to ancient Israel, you're a Gentile. My family line goes as far back as the woods in Missouri. That's so what my great grandpa told me one time. I said, where we come from? He said, the woods. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. So Paul is talking to all kinds of different believers from different places of different races with different backgrounds. But in this part of the conversation, right here in Romans chapter 11, he's in the middle of a conversation that he started in, in chapter nine and he's gonna finish throughout at the end of this chapter. And in this conversation, 
that we get a snapshot into, he's talking to Jews. He's talking to Israelites. He's talking specifically to the nation of Israel about the future of the nation of Israel. And so once again, we're, we're Gentiles. And so that is part of the reason why when we read this chapter, we tend to gloss over it because I'm not Jewish. So that must mean that Paul isn't talking to me. I'm, I'm not Jewish, so this doesn't apply to my life. But even in this moment, friends, even in the middle of Paul's conversation about native Jews, the biological descendants of Abraham, God has something to say to us. And far too often, church, we miss what God is trying to say all because we quickly come to the decision that God must not be talking to me. This part, this chapter, this must not apply to me because I'm not Jewish and so we move past it and we miss what God is trying to say. Friends, I grew up in church. I told you my grandpa was a pastor for 30 years. I've heard countless sermons on every topic under the sun. I'm my grandfather's oldest grandson, and for whatever reason, he decided that I was going to be the one who traveled with him to every speaking engagement he ever went to. Somehow, he got his name on the list where he could pull me out of school early. And I'd be in the middle of recess, and I'm like, your grandfather's here. Why? Why? We gotta go speak somewhere. You gotta go speak somewhere. I gotta play games with my friends. And he would take me to the speaking game. When I was a little kid, when I was a baby, he loved it when toddlers were in church because sometimes the people wouldn't be speaking back to him enough, you know, because he's a Southern, you know, woods of Missouri. He, people wouldn't be speaking back to him enough. And so when the babies would cry, he'd be like, oh, that's the Lord telling me I'm doing a good job. And there were moments where I would cry and he would pick me up and he'd hold me in the pulpit and finish his message. I've been in services where I've said, this does not apply to me. What you are talking about has no bearing on my life. This service, the pastor is not speaking to me. This service is not for me. And so I've thrown it away. I've written that Sunday off. Well, friends, there's a truth that all of us need to recognize. There is no such thing as a throwaway Sunday. Whenever any person stands on this stage or on the floor, wherever it may be, and they begin to talk about this book, and they open it, and they begin to read the very words of God himself, friends, God has something uniquely amazing and diverse to say to you right there in that moment. So before we move on, we need to ask, God, what are you saying this morning? Will you stand with me? Father God, we're here for no other reason but to meet with you. God, we are here for no other reason than to experience your presence. God, we need to hear a word from you today. So God, this morning we ask, with open hearts, with open minds, with open ears, with open lives. What do you have to say to us today? What do you have to say to me today? God, I'm ready for your word. Speak. Holy Spirit, move. Take residence in our hearts this morning. Show us your glory. Tell us your word. Father, we're here for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? You can be seated unless you want to stand the whole time. Romans 11, Paul is finishing this conversation with uh, the nation of Israel that he started in chapter 9. And once again, the nation of Israel, the chosen people of God, the family of Abraham, they have rejected God and they've turned away from his plan for them. And if this is news to you, you just need to open and start reading in Genesis 1 because this is the MO of the Israelites. This is how they lived. They had a word from the Lord. The Lord said, this is how I want you to live. This is where I am leading you to. And they said, all right, we're going. Never mind, we're gonna do our own thing. 
over and over and over and over again. And so here we are at another moment in history, another moment in the history of the nation of Israel where they have abandoned God, they've turned away from his promise, they've forsaken his word, and they are living their own plan and walking their own path. But friends, just because Israel has given up on God, that does not mean that God has given up on Israel. Paul says it like this in Romans 11, verses one through two. I ask then, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Of course not. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. No, God has not rejected his own people whom he chose from the very beginning. So what that means is, and this is my main point today, God has a plan but we have a choice. God has a plan, but we have a choice. We can choose to follow God's plan. We can choose to live out the purpose that God has created us to live with, or we can choose not to. God has a plan, but we have a choice. And friends, if you don't know this, his plan is that we would live in close relationship with him. We would live experiencing his presence on a daily basis, just like they did in Eden before Adam and Eve broke the relationship, before our ancestors ruined everything. You know, sometimes we just need somebody to put the blame on, Adam and Eve, everything. They ruined it all. They, like, I stubbed my toe today, it's Adam's fault. I, my car wouldn't start, Eve's fault. I don't, they ruined everything. In the Garden of Eden, we had perfection. We were walking with God in the cool of the day. His physical presence was with us, but they broke the relationship. But even though they broke the relationship, God has a plan. And we have a complete record of his plan for restoration. And his plan for us is to have salvation and for the relationship to be restored for all of us. And he started with Abraham. And he started with Abraham's family. And a couple weeks ago, Pastor Kerry talked about this. He went into detail about God choosing Abraham's family to bring about salvation for the world. And if you missed that one, friends, you can once again find that on the YouTube. And if Pastor Zach isn't available, Pastor Brian is, to let you know how to get to the YouTube. Because you could honestly just Google the YouTube and you'd find it. But God's plan... God's plan from the very beginning was always meant for all people throughout all of time. And he started with Abraham's family, but because of their rejection, because of their bad choice, now us Gentiles, we have the freedom to choose to come to Jesus and redeem the relationship that our ancestors broke in Eden. That should get you excited. We have access to our creator now. Paul says it like this in our text, Romans 11, 11 through 12. Did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. They were disobedient, so God made salvation available to the Gentiles. But he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Now if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world will share when they finally accept it. God has a plan for all of us to experience him and receive salvation in Jesus, but we have a choice to make. God has a plan, but we have a choice. As I was studying for this, I read, I read this in a commentary. Paul says in, 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 in verse 12, uh, or excuse me, at the end of verse 11, he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it, this salvation for the cells that the Gentiles are experiencing. God wanted Jews to, to be provoked to jealousy. He wanted them to become jealous and see the salvation that the Gentiles have and they claim it for themselves. And this, uh, Warren Wiersbe, he wrote this commentary and he asked this question. As believers in Jesus, as followers of Jesus, as people who have experienced salvation in Jesus, are we living a life that provokes people to jealousy of our salvation or are we living a life that just provokes people to anger? Is the life that you are living showing your friends the salvation that you have in Jesus, showing your loved ones the salvation that you have in Jesus, that they become so jealous of what you have that they try to draw closer to Jesus? Or are you living a life that pushes people away? 
Does the Jesus that you show on a daily basis draw people to him? Or does the Jesus that you show on a daily basis push people farther away from him? Because if that's the answer, friends, you ain't showing Jesus. You've left him somewhere in the dust. That's not even in my notes. That was for free for you guys today. God has a plan, but we have a choice. And for the rest of our time today, we're gonna live in Romans chapter 11, verse 11. Did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. They were disobedient, so God made salvation available to the Gentiles. But he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Did God's people stumble and fall so far away that they're beyond recovery? Of course not. Why? Because, friends, the truth is this. No one is too far gone to be saved. I'll repeat it for my friends in the back. No one is too far gone to be saved. For my friends at the mass service, no one is too far gone to be saved. That, in my opinion, makes Romans 11, 11, one of the most encouraging verses in this entire book because nobody is too far gone to be saved. God made a promise to Abraham long ago that he would bless the world through his descendants, and that's exactly what he did. From Abraham came Jesse, from Jesse came David, and then from the line of David came a man named Jesus Christ, who they call the Prince of Peace, the Savior of the world, the King of Kings, the Son of God, and through Jesus Christ we have access. We have opportunity to know our Creator. We have salvation that we didn't have before. We have hope for eternity that only comes from Jesus. Paul says it like this in Romans eleven seventeen. 17. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. And you Gentiles, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing that God has promised to Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. So now, so now you also receive the blessing that God has promised. No one is too far gone to be saved. God chose Abraham and his family, but his intention from the very beginning was to extend it to all of humanity. And now we as Gentiles have access and opportunity to come to the root of God, the root that provides nourishment that we can't find anywhere else, the root, the root that provides water that quenches thirst that no other water can quench we have access because no one is too far gone to be saved no one is too far gone to be saved through salvation in Jesus we have been grafted into the family adopted as sons and daughters co-heirs with Christ children of God that should get you fired up this morning because that means that you have access to the Lord of Lords who is here the God of miracles who is in the room his spirit is in residence right now in the hearts of people who are willing to say, I surrender myself and I'll follow Jesus forever. And if you don't know that relationship, friends, I'd love, I would love to introduce you to Jesus today. If you don't know that relationship, I would love to introduce you to Jesus today. And so look at this. If you're here and you know Jesus, and you have known Jesus, and you've experienced this relationship, the salvation that you've experienced is available to all of your friends and all of your family, no matter how far they are running away from him right now in the opposite direction. No one is too far gone to be saved. No one's soul is too dead to be brought back to life. How do I know? Because Jesus is alive, and the Spirit of God that brought him out of the grave is in residence in my soul this morning morning no one is too far gone to be saved the promise that we've been grafted into friends is a promise that any person who would choose Jesus any person who would call on the name of Jesus and surrender will be saved that's a guarantee and I don't know who needs to hear this right now online at home 
in the mass service here in the room this morning, I don't know who needs to hear this right now, but your son is not too far gone. Keep praying for him. Your daughter, she is not lost forever. Keep believing in faith that one day she will meet Jesus. Your grandbaby's soul is not too far dead and gone for the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you to not be able to revive them to life. Just keep praying. Just keep standing on the promise. Just keep reaching out in the love of Christ and know that the word of God will never return void to him. No one is too far gone to be saved. One final story and then we're gonna be done. This truth, this truth is my reality. I am here today because of the people in my life who believed that I was not too far gone to be saved. I told you my, my grandfather retired and that's kind of the truth. It wasn't by choice. It was at the hands of church family members who decided they didn't want him there anymore. And so as they told my grandpa, you're not welcome here, they told my family, you're not welcome here. And at the hands of people that I grew up with, believing that they were my family and they loved me deeply, I experienced some of the greatest pain that I've ever known in my life. And it was in that moment that I said, I don't want this. I don't want this. Worship team, you can come. It was in that moment I decided this is not for me any longer. I don't want Jesus. I don't want to be in church. I don't want to know these people anymore. I experienced some of the deepest pain that I've ever known. And I made a personal decision to walk away from Jesus. I made a personal decision to leave him behind in my life. I would go through the motions at church to make my mom and dad happy. I would warm a pew because my parents asked me to and my mama is scary when she's not happy. And so I would go to church on Sundays and I would sit there and I would sing the songs and I would go to youth group on Wednesday nights and I would sit there and I would act like I was all in. I would act like I was invested, but friends, my heart was far away from him. In my heart, in my life, I was far away from Jesus. But God had a plan and I had a grandma and a grandfather who stood on a promise that God had made to them that one day I would be in the pulpit of a church. I had parents who were unwilling to believe that I was too far gone to be saved. I had family members, aunts and uncles who were praying for me. I had a youth pastor and Pastor Brian and Jamie Smith who was determined to tell me the truth about Jesus no matter how many times I left early, no matter how many times I told them I don't care, I don't wanna know. I had volunteer youth leaders like Jared Atchison and Kevin Marshall who decided for me because I was a dumb teenager, they weren't gonna let me decide for myself. They decided for me that I wasn't gonna sit in the back row and mess around and not hear the truth of the gospel. I had friends like Pastor Zach and Marin who as teenagers invited me to hang out with them instead of going to places I know I shouldn't be going and doing things I know I shouldn't be doing. For me, for me there were people who were praying for me when they didn't even know my story, they didn't even know my name like my in-laws who prayed for the man that would marry their daughter, and my wife, Carissa, who was praying for her future husband and asking God for a man that followed after him. For me, for me, there were people who believed in faith and stood on a promise from God that I was not too far gone to be saved. And by the grace of God and the mercy of Jesus Christ, I am standing on this platform today telling you that there is somebody in your life who needs you to believe and have faith that they are not too far gone to be saved.
There is somebody in your life that needs you to believe that they are not too far gone to be saved. So as we end this morning, I wanna put this into practice. As a church family, together we're going to believe in faith for our loved ones, our neighbors, our friends, the people that we avoid at the grocery store. We're going to believe that there is no one in our life that is too far gone to be saved. This morning, we're going to believe together. And in just a moment, we're gonna to stand together in prayer that the people we love will have an encounter with Jesus that will save their lives. And so right now, right now, if there is someone in your life that is running hard and fast in the opposite direction of Jesus, and you either are already believing for them or you need to receive faith to believe that no matter what, they will never be too far gone. I want you to stand. I want you to stand in this moment. Praise God. Praise God. Is there a neighbor, maybe a friend, a son, a daughter, a son-in-law, a daughter-in-law, a grandbaby, a niece, a nephew, a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, an aunt or an uncle? Is there someone in your life someone in your life that you need to stand in the gap for right now and believe they're not too far gone to be saved. If you are standing, or even if you're not, I wanna ask this question. Is there somebody in this room who would stand in the gap for our nation? Is there someone in this room who would believe that America is not too far gone to be saved? That our politicians are not too far gone to be saved? That God can do a radical transformation in this nation? If you believe that, would you just raise a hand to heaven? We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray for our nation. We're gonna pray for our loved ones. And I'm gonna ask that you lift both hands to heaven if you're able to receive from God what he's trying to do in their lives. But I want you to know this, if you are standing, if your hands are raised, you are representing that person in the gap, but you are also asking God to use you as a vessel of his love, his grace, his hope, his mercy. And so as we pray, know that we're not only praying for them, but we're praying for God to use us to reach them. So if you're not standing this morning, will you in faith as a member of this church family extend a hand to heaven? Father God, Father God, we are standing representing our loved ones, representing our family members, representing those people that we care about so deeply, asking that you would save them, asking that you would use us to reach out to them, to change their lives. God, we are representing brokenness, we are representing darkness that needs the light of Jesus, that needs the healing hand of Jesus Christ to come through and touch them. And so God, I ask as a church family, as people in this house who believe in your name, God, that you would use us to reach out, that you would use us to reach out to our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our grandmothers, our grandfathers, our fathers, God, our aunts, our uncles, our nieces, our nephews, our cousins, God, our friends, our neighbors, that you would ask that you would use us, God, to reach out to this nation, to be a light in the darkness, to show them Jesus who could heal the brokenness. God, use us this morning. Jesus, I believe that you have something you want to do. You have a person on every person's mind that you wanna use them to save. So God, I ask in this moment that you would use us. I ask in this moment that we would be light in dark places, that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus in this nation, that you would use us, God to bring about a revival so great, so great, that nobody could stay away from you. Jesus, it's in your mighty and holy name we pray. Everybody said, I believe pre-celebrating what God is going to do in the future. So can we just celebrate right now what God is going to do? This morning, as I was preparing for this message, I was challenged by God. He said, August, there's people in your life that you believe are too far gone to be saved. And I challenge you to put them on a prayer list, submit them to me in prayer.
every day. And so I took that challenge and, and here's what I want is I don't only just wanna pray for my people, I wanna pray for your people. And so I got this list here, some from first service as well. But if you're comfortable and you're willing, I'd like to meet you down front here so I can pray for your people, so I can add their name to my list and I can believe in faith that there's nothing that our God can't do and that they're not too far gone to be saved.